to the Adele Nadell Show, brought to you each week this time from the studios at WCBT-FM. Welcome to the Adele Nudel Show, heard live every Wednesday, 1 to 1.30. We talk to women 30 through old age. We talk about health, jobs, family relationships, sex, and feelings. We talk to women in crisis, women making change, and men who relate to women. Today, our guests are David and Isabel Rosenberg, a couple who are going to tell us how to cope with family illness and how to successfully struggle through the crisis. They have done it successfully, and I'm delighted they're here with us today so they can tell you and me how to do it successfully. Welcome, David. How do you do? Welcome, Isabel. Thank you, Adele. And some of you may remember that Isabel was with us once before, you know, quite recently when she told us about her crisis, her health crisis. Isabel, David, yours is a story of how a family can survive and cope in the face of illness. It's an inspiring story, and as I said, one that can teach other families in stress. Let's start at the beginning. How long have you been married? On May the 27th of this year, we celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. Ah, and you have two sons. How old are they? Yes, uh, Mark is 18 and Bruce is 14 years old. Now, Isabel and David, in the beginning of your marriage, illness had not yet hit. Isabel, you eventually developed cancer. You told us about that when you, you know, appeared on our show before. How old were your children when you became ill? I became ill with breast cancer ten and a half years ago. Mark was seven and Bruce was four at that time. And uh, from what I understand, at the uh, times you still have to cope with your illness you still get treatment David you became ill later what was the diagnosis I had cancer of the right colon ah and how did you discover you were ill what were your symptoms well I was on a sales trip in Wilkesboro Pennsylvania before I went to bed I felt that I might be developing diarrhea I found out I was bleeding heavily the next morning it happened again I usually, usually I call Isabel in the evening to share the news of the day, but I called her in the morning when I continued to bleed. I explained to Isabel what was happening. I know now what passed through her mind, but she couldn't speak it, and she asked me to come home right away. And uh, what happened then, David? Well, Isabel made an appointment for me to see a very well-known proctologist, Dr. Jack Rosin. Arrangements were made for me to have a barium enema test, which showed that I had a spot on my right colon. I was admitted for surgery for an intestinal polyp. After the operation, Dr. Rosen told Isabel there was a malignancy, and we would have to wait a week to see if it had spread. In other words, you needed further testing? Uh, well, we had to wait for the reports to come back. I see. Throughout that week, Isabel just couldn't bear telling me that I had cancer. At the end of the week, Dr. Rosen told her the tests were negative and there was no spread. I was stunned when Dr. Rosen revealed to me for the first time that it was cancer. I guess when it happens to us, we can't really believe it. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. Isabel wanted me to see Drs. Abeloff and Dr. Cole about chemotherapy. Dr. Abeloff said there was no data indicating that the drugs were effective in preventing a reoccurrence of colon cancer. But I saw what the drugs had done for Isabel, and I wanted to give them a try. For the next 18 months, we made a rather unusual couple, as every once in a while we go together to Hopkins to receive our cancer drugs. I received four daily doses of 5-FU intravenously, and methyl CCNU by mouth every five weeks. These are, these are chemicals that you're talking about drugs. Yes, to mm -hmm. combat the cancer. Mm -hmm. 
The doctor said, I do not know whether chemotherapy will prevent a reoccurrence or whether I would not have had one without the drugs. It would not have mattered to me what the reason was for preventing future problems as long as I did not have a recurrence. David, you were both sick at the same time. Yes, weren't we were. You, weren't you terribly frightened? Well, we were a little frightened, but uh, we try to support each other. Um, uh, I know, the, the we fear, were, uh, it didn't take over, in other words. You were able to cope with that. Well, I was frightened and surprised when the doctor revealed to me for the first time that it was cancer. Yes, I was frightened, but I was told that if you get to colon cancer early enough, it can be prevented from spreading. I am checked once a year with a sig sigmoidoscope. What's that? What's that? Uh, that's an instrument that they put up your rectum to look at your colon. Mm -hmm. And this is a fairly new uh, instrument that they can see both your lower and upper colon. And you don't have to be put to sleep for this. It's not a painful. No, it's not a painful. Just a little uncomfortable. <laughs> that, that's that's very encouraging to know that this kind of technology has been developed. Yes, it's a big help. Yes. Uh, no, I have tests by uh, Dr. Cole, our oncologist. Uh, these tests are usually routine now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I have been cancer-free now for five years, which is close to the clinical definition of a cure. Congratulations. Thank you. David, how did you handle, handle your fears? Well, during the 18 months I received cancer drugs, we sustained each other. I kept busy, always tried to block the negative things from my mind. Now, now tell me uh, how you did that. Now, I always find it fascinating when people tell me they can block the negative things from their mind. How did you do that? Well, I tried to dismiss the things that worried me and think of uh, pleasant things like uh, planning a trip, like uh, going to different affairs that we were uh, invited to. But think of positive and pleasant things. So you actually push the negative things away from your back mind. back of my mind, yes. Good tip for our listeners and for me. Okay. And Isabel, how did you handle your fears about your husband's illness? Well, not too well in the beginning. I had had one and a half years of chemotherapy and was still on the drugs, adriamycin and cytoxin. I was worried. I was doing better. But I still wasn't out of the woods, and only time would tell the complete story for David. I thought, what would come of us? How should we plan for the future? Should we change our wills? Most of all, if the worst should happen, what would come of the children? If anyone would like to uh, talk personally to David Rosenberg, to Isabel Rosenberg, who are with us today telling us how they coped with illness, how they successfully emerged from this crisis, dial 321-2897, 321-2897. At the time you were both ill, you still had to work. You, in fact, each had your own demanding careers, and you still had to be parents to two small boys, active boys. How did you each manage to uh, act like, like uh, life was normal? Well, since our nausea occurred only when we received our chemotherapy, we felt it was essential to go on with other aspects of our lives. We felt the importance of trying to live a normal life for our own emotional well-being. Although we discussed our illnesses, we tried not to dwell on them. And that your children had no inkling you were sick. What made you decide not to tell them anything at the time you were ill? Well, Mark and Bruce were four and seven when I had the mastectomy. They were eight and 11 when I had metatastic breast carcinoma. And they were nine and 12 when David had cancer of the colon. We felt it was unfair to saddle the boys with such a burden of fear and worry that they might be left without parents at an early age. When you look back, Isabel and David, do you feel it would have been better to have said something to the children then? No, we did not choose to tell them until recently when we were encouraged by Dr. Cole to discuss it with them. They are older now and have seemed to accept the explanation without causing them to be upset. 
they see us functioning as normal human beings. Therefore, they really don't think of us as sickly. And you certainly look very healthy. <laughs> Uh, you were both very supportive to each other during your illnesses. Give our listeners, if you would, some tips on how they can be supportive to spouses who are ill. Well, many women following a mastectomy suffer terrible self-image problems. Isabel was no exception. I repeated many times that removal of one of her breasts did not alter or change my feelings for her. When Isabel is dressed, she looks like any other woman. I try to remember to always compliment her on her appearance. I like that. I like that. Um, Isabel, uh, how, what tips would you give our listeners on how they can be supportive to spouses who are ill? Well, David was stunned when a talk with his surgeon revealed to him for the first time that it was cancer. I wanted him to see doctors Abeloff and Cole about chemotherapy. Of course, there wasn't any data indicating that the drugs were effective in preventing cancer. But as David said earlier, I see what the drugs have done for you, and I want to give them a try. It was a period when we sustained each other. David had supported me for so long, and now I could at least return the favor. Apart from feeling that inevitable and awful nausea now and then, he felt well and was able to lead a fairly normal life. Since I experienced similar feelings from my treatments, perhaps I was just a little more in tune with his anxiety and his wish to get over the effects of the drugs as soon as possible. I believe we supported each other through our illnesses with the firm belief that we did have confidence in the prospects of recovery from cancer. Again, if any listeners would like to talk to David Rosenberg or Isabel Rosenberg about how they dealt with family illness together, supported each other, and survived, successfully survived their relationship through all this, dial 321-2897, 321-2897. You most, must have... Um, have both faced the question of what you could do to see that your children, the boys, had security and a good home if anything dire happened. What plans did you make? It is so important to have an up-to-date will, especially if young children are involved. After David and I were both stricken with cancer, I made an appointment with our attorney to make the necessary arrangements for the boys. David and I agreed on all of the important issues. In other words, did you decide on a, a guardian who would take the children? Yes, we did. Uh-huh. Okay. And finally, uh, you told the boys about Isabel's cancer. What were their reactions? Uh, they were very understanding, just marvelous. They asked intelligent questions, and I tried to answer them very candidly. They see that I am not handicapped, and I really don't think they think of me as sickly. David, Isabel, or either of you, is there a right way to tell children about illness? Well, I think if a parent is considered terminal and death is imminent, I think children must be told the truth as soon as possible. How they are told would really depend upon their ages. I think children should be prepared for all aspects of life, including poor health. Again, the kind of explanation would depend on the age of the child. Uh, they must be told something, mm -hmm. as they must learn to cope with illness in a family. There is a bond and a certain unity of the family that can develop as a result of not only sharing happy events, but painful ones also. And I guess kids can feel very left out and alone and even more fearful if they're not told because they can often sense something is wrong. I believe they can. Mm -hmm. David, how have you told the children about your illness? Well, they were very young at the time of my surgery and we saw no immediate need to explain it then. When we were discussing your show, Isabel and I decided to explain my illness to the boys. Before so, you came on the show? Yes. 
Well, since we knew they would listen to the tapes, mm -hmm. quite frankly, the show opened up an easy way to tell them about my illness. I'm glad. <laughs> Can you give us an idea, since it was such a recent disclosure you made to them about your illness when you told them, and you do remember probably what you said, what did you say to them, actually? This might be helpful to listeners who are going through this. Well, we sat them down and we explained to them about my operation. They asked questions, what type of operation, and we explained to them that uh, they uh, had part of my intestines removed, although we have quite a bit, say about six feet or more of intestine. And uh, they accepted it. They asked a few questions, and they were satisfied with our answers about a piece being cut out, and now we're fine. So you ended up... Uh, with the reassuring them. Reassuring them that uh -huh. everything was all right. And I heard something else you said that must have been reassuring to them, that we have a, many feet of intestines. Yes. In other words, right, okay. Were friends helpful during this time? Well, many showed their concern about us. However, some were more solicitous than others. Some people, I guess, are afraid of themselves uh, and feel threatened. That's true. Uh -huh. Did you get emotional support from your families? Yes, we did. Many members of our families kept in touch with us and offered support. Some with very encouraging words and others with supportive actions. And um, if you will tell our listeners, give our, tips, uh, give our listeners tips on how family and friends can help. What can they say? What can they do? Well, I believe first and foremost, uh, don't hesitate to talk about it, especially if the pain patient has responded well to treatment. After all, we didn't have anything contagious, and so much can be done for so many people now. Really listen and try to understand when a member of your family or friends have been stricken with cancer and want to talk about it. If you know someone who is going for radiation or chemotherapy, offer to go to the hospital with them on occasion. They need all the support they can get. Continue to include the stricken person in your plans as long as he or she feels up to it. We need to keep our minds occupied with many things other than dwelling on the fact that we have been treated for cancer. For those who have been sincere and helpful, we shall never forget their concern and their thoughtfulness. Yes, yes. I think that uh, it's even hard in our society for people to say the word cancer. And I, I, I think that uh, uh, even in hospitals, the helping professions, doctors and nurses in certain hospitals have codes and terms they use for it that really, you know, are not, <laughs> isn't the word cancer. It's hard to be direct about something that's so threatening. I have you think found so. that to Yes, be I think so. Most people try to uh, avoid talking yeah, about it. Yeah. So any, They're any, afraid. Yes, yeah, so any kind of help, any kind of tips you can give family and friends on how to be helpful is, is good. You're both still leading, still you are leading, active, vital lives. David, what's your prognosis, if you don't mind sharing that information with us? Well, it has been five years since my surgery, and I have, had, I have not had a reoccurrence. Therefore, I'm considered cancer-free since it is very important to catch any kind of cancer in its early stages i continue to go to my proctologist once a year for an examination so he can detect my problems that might you know occur i also go to dr cole our oncologist at johns hopkins once a year who examines me and arranges other necessary tests these are routine tests and usually follow any serious illness my experience with illness has made me aware of the multitude of things that can happen to a human being. Therefore, we should take advantage of the advancements in medicine that have made it possible to prolong life. It was a fortunate thing when the polyp perforated and bled. It was my only symptom that something was wrong. I was told that this was a blessing in disguise. If it had not perforated and bled, I would not have had any symptoms of a serious illness until it was too late. I think the public should be educated concerning tests for early detection of colon cancer. Absolutely, and I'm so glad you're on today for that reason also. David, has your philosophy in life, with life, 
been affected by your experience with cancer? Well, my philosophy of life has not changed too much, as I've always tried to look on the bright side. I know when things look the darkest that you should always tell yourself better days are just ahead, and this has realistically happened to us. And if anyone has any questions, again, dial 321-2897, 321-2897. Isabel, has your philosophy of life changed or been altered through your experience with illness? Yes, uh, I think so, because I've been at both ends of the spectrum. The depths of despair, feeling that I would die and just not recover from this illness, and pure joy, knowing that I was on the road to recovery, and that hopefully I would be able to remain on this marvelous planet for a while. We can't always control events in our lives, but we can control our reactions to those events. An incident that happened shortly after my first drug, drug treatment puts it in perspective for me. Before we left the hospital, David introduced me to another breast cancer patient, a woman he had known some years back. She greeted me warmly enough, but wasted no time launching into her tale of woe. Not only do I have this cancer, but I have a husband 20 years younger than me who could care less. It's awful, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sitting here in this hospital, and I have nothing to show for my life. As she went on in this vein, I found myself feeling not pity, but anger. She seemed to have let things overwhelm her, and I could sense that she was about ready to give up and let the cancer take its course. I didn't say as much, but I felt certain that if she kept up this way, she would be dead within a year. And in fact, she was. In short, you can't give up. We have a call. This is the Adele Nudel Show. You're on. Uh, hello. Um... I'd like to ask a question to uh, Mrs. Rosenberg. Um, how does she fight uh, depression? How, uh, how does she fight depression? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Isabel, how do you fight depression? How did you? Well, first of all, I uh, felt that uh, it was a normal thing to be depressed from time to time with an illness. Uh, with the illness that I had, and I accepted that fact. And uh, if I felt that I needed help, I would definitely seek the proper professional type of pro help. Type, yes, the uh, professional help uh, that could help me through some difficult times. Has yes, this I been, do. Has that answer been helpful to you? Well, uh, what uh, outside uh, help did you use? Well, I have used a psychologist from time to time who has been helpful to me. And um, I think that um, my being able to share it with someone and explain my fears and anxiety uh, have helped me get through some of the difficult periods. I do want to mention uh, if uh, our caller is suffering from cancer or knows someone who is, uh, there is a marvelous group called Make Today Count, and uh, if anyone wants to call me, I can tell them, uh, uh, you know, where to get in touch with that group. Or call the American Cancer Society, actually, for that information. They can give you times and places where they meet. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Hello, you're on. This is the Adele Nadell Show. You're on. Hello. Yeah. Hello? Yes, hello, you're on. This is the Adele Nadell Show. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you turn your radio down? Okay. Hello? Oh, hello? I don't know whether you can hear me or not. I can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. My question is, after the children were told, the aunt of both of the parents, what was their reaction? Were they able to accept it? Uh, yes, they were. Uh, I think uh, they have accepted it uh, very well because, uh, first of all, they do not see us handicapped. They do not see us in bed all the, all the time. They see us functioning as 
normal human beings and I believe this has helped them to accept our explanations and not to worry too much about it. Thank you for calling. Well, we can see that our listening audience has a lot of concerns, as we all do, about illness, cancer, uh, because I think you mentioned, David, before the show, before we went on, if we live long enough, we're going to have to cope with many crises in our life. That's true. He did say that. Um, you were telling us, um, Isabel, about a woman that you met who had a, a reaction of being overwhelmed and angry, and she didn't survive. She was not a fighter. And I think you were going to uh, mention Norman Cousins' book, Human Options. Yes, I really would like to quote Norman Co Cousins from his book, Human options, I think it puts everything in a very good perspective. And this is what he had to say in his book. There is no single formula for human survival, but the approach to survival has two main elements. The first is that we ought never to minimize or underestimate the nature of the problems that confront us. The second is that we ought never to minimize or underestimate our ability to deal with them. Human potentiality is the least understood and most squandered resource on Earth. So long as human beings are capable of growth, intellectual, spiritual, and philosophical, they have a chance, a very good chance. The healing system and the belief system work together. The healing system is the way the body mobilizes all its resources to combat disease. The belief system represents a unique element in human beings that makes it possible for the human mind to affect the workings of the body. How one responds intellectually, emotionally, or spiritually to one's problems has a great deal to do with the way the human body functions. The belief system is no substitute for competent medical attention in serious illness or vice versa. Both are essential. That was Norman Cousins uh, yes. from his book called Human Options. Didn't he uh, also write Another book? Yes, called The Anatomy of an Illness, which is autobiographical, and uh, it's an autobiography. About his own? Uh, about his own struggle with uh, disease, yes. If I remember, um, if I remember, he talked about humor as getting us through a lot of problems and crises. Yes, he did discuss that. We have a few more minutes. Dial 321-2897 with any questions or any comments. 321-2897. Us to be right now, Isabel. Well, in conclusion, I think my philosophy live right now. Enjoy life. When you are eating, savor every savor your food, enjoy it. When you are loving, love. When you are looking at a beautiful picture, really look at it. When you are talking with someone, talk and enjoy the conversation. Try to catch the beauty of every moment. You know, you're both strong people, or else you wouldn't Thanks. have gotten through this, really. You're both strong people. How did you meet years ago? How many years has it been now that you've been married? Well, over 20 years, but uh, we met about 22 years How ago. did you meet? Well, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was quite an interesting story. Uh, uh, I was given Isabel's name uh, to call up, and she was away uh, at that time. It wouldn't be back for, uh, I'd say, three months. And uh, I just put it away, and I didn't call it again. Oh, about a year and a half later, someone else gave me a name. I had forgotten her name by that time. And I called her up, and I started taking her out again. And then I realized, in fact, my mother told me, who had given me her name before, a friend had given her the name, that this was a girl that I had called over a year and a half ago. So what will be, will be. 
I'm, <laughs> I feel that way, and we got together and got married. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother fixed you up. My mother fixed me up, actually. And, no, actually, afterwards, a friend gave me a name, uh -huh. her name again, uh -huh. who she had done. She was doing volunteer work uh -huh. at the hospital, and she had worked with her. And she gave me her name to take her out, and that's how we got together again. We have another minute. Let me ask you this. Were there a was there anything in either of your childhoods that prepared you to be strong people? Well, I had a lot of support from my parents, and uh, they always took the bright side. Whatever was wrong, they always said everything will come out all right. And uh, mind over matter, I'm a great believer in that. Were you always? Yes. Even as a young man? Even as a young man. Hmm. Was there anything in your childhood, Isabel, that gave you particular strengths, or did you have to create your own? I saw how my mother um, uh, she lived, and she struggled with cancer for many years, but she was very strong throughout it all. And uh, I believe uh, she was a very good example for me in every way. She was an extremely strong person. She was a role model for you? Yes, she was. And uh, how old was she uh, when uh, she had cancer? Well, uh, she really had her first tumor uh, about 12 years before she passed away, mm -hmm. but she had reoccurrences, and there was very little they could do for cancer in those days. Of course, that was a different story in those days. Yes. We can't compare it with today. Absolutely. Yes. There was not much they could do. Yeah, then. and as you said before, David, on the show, let's take advantage of all the medical technology that has developed. Absolutely. They can do a lot more today than they could years ago. It's been marvelous having both of you on. I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been an inspiration. You've been really helpful to all of us. Well, it's now that time, time to say goodbye. This is Adele Nudell inviting you to listen to the Adele Nudell Show every Wednesday, 1 to 1.30. I talk to women 30 through old age. We talk about health, jobs, family relationships, sex, and feelings. Thank you again, David and Isabel Rosenberg, for being on the show today. I'll be talking to all of you next week. That was Adele Nudell, women's counselor and author of the book, The Woman Over 50. Join her next week at this time for another edition of her show, The Adele Nudell Show, brought to you by FMA 9.7.